Okay, thank you, Jaylon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining. I know this is um, these middle of the day times um, during the work week, work week are hard to make. Um, so, and I know everyone's really busy these days. So thank you for making time to join and to hear the, the mission and vision of a great organization and some of the impactful work Refugee is doing. Um, so it's been almost a year since I've, uh, I've been part of the board. Um, and, you know, when I first joined, I was very passionate about um, the organization's focus on refu refugees, especially women who without their families are, you know, most vulnerable in these countries. But since uh, being part of the organization for some time now, I've experienced firsthand what's happening and I've been so impressed with what I've seen, you know, hearing some of the, uh, the stories of our women who have been through the program and seeing the overall impact the local Kenya team is having on so many lives. Um, even with COVID, you know, fighting through some of the tougher months of COVID when it was rampant in Kenya, the team has, uh, has encountered so many obstacles. So, you know, with everything I've learned, I, I wanted to bring this awareness um, of what's happening to my network, which, which is the reason for the session today. So with that, um, I wanted to start by introducing Dina Duhan. Um, Dina is our new managing director at Refugee. She's located in the US and she just started with us very recently. So these are you know, very exciting times for the organization as we, as we continue to grow and help support more, more refugees. Um, and having someone with, with Dina's back, background and caliber, caliber is amazing. She comes with more than 20 years um, in the field of global development and non-for-profit leadership. So we're really excited to have Dina. Thanks, Dina, for, for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce our team and the speakers to get us going. Thanks, everybody, for your time today. Thank you very much, Hani, and thank you for hosting us today. We are really blessed of having you and other board members who are very supportive of the work of our organization. Um, as Hani said, I am the new uh, US-based Managing Director, and I want to thank you all for your time today and for joining us to learn more about the work that our colleagues do in Kenya in support of girls and young women refugees. And I want to start the introductions with introducing Jelan Adli, uh, who's also based in the US. Um, Jelan is a refugee board member, but also she is the outgoing uh, managing director. So a lot of the things that we'll be saying today is to her credit. And we have been lucky that she's giving us the time to help in the transition. And also with us today, we have two of our Kenya-based staff who are also the leaders on the ground, and they are the one who implement the work, and they are the frontliners for all the great work we do as an organization, and without them, uh, not much can be accomplished. So I want to start by introducing Nancy Tamasha. Nancy is the Associate Director of Safe House and Case Management, and Jawan Muningza, who is our Legal and Advocacy Officer. Um, I will stop here and hand it over to them. We will have some time for questions and answers, but um, basically all the important information will be coming from them today and they will walk, walk us through the presentation. Thank you again, Hani, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Dina, for that introduction and uh, a warm welcome to our guests who have found a uh, time to join us for this webinar. So to start you off, I'm going to take you through um, the refugee situation globally, as well as uh, in Kenya. So uh, let's look at some of the statistics that uh, we have so far. And uh, globally, there are about 70.8 million people around the world uh, who have been forced to leave their homes due to conflict and uh, persecution. So the refugee problem is therefore a worldwide uh, problem. Among them, 30 million are refugees. Over half of uh, this number are under the age of 18 years. The refugee problem has uh, three solutions to it, and uh, they include voluntary repatriation. This uh, simply means that the refugees reavail themselves of the national protection of their country. And um, this could arise if, for instance, the circumstances which led to their flight um, no longer exist. 
Secondly, uh, the second solution is uh, local integration for refugees. Uh, this means that uh, refugees are accepted to integrate in the country of asylum and possibly granted citizenship um, of, of that country. And lastly, we have uh, resettlement. Resettlement simply means uh, the transfer of refugees from the country of asylum to a third country, which has agreed to admit them and uh, ultimately grant them permanent residence. However, resettlement opportunities are shrinking uh, world over. So as part of providing solution to this problem, Refishi has been able to facilitate resettlement processes of her beneficiaries uh, to third world countries like the US, Canada, Australia, among others. Now, Kenya plays a host to hundreds of thousands of refugees and asylum seekers from diverse nationalities, including Somalia, Sudan, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Uganda, among other African countries. This has uh, been caused by political instabilities in their countries of origin. Now, according to UNHCR June 30th, 2021 statistics, Kenya hosts about half a million registered refugees and asylum seekers, majority of whom uh, are from Somalia, followed by South Sudan and Congo, uh, respectively. Nairobi and other urban centers had about 80,000 registered refugees and asylum seekers, 52% of, of which are minors. And out of this number, 49 are young girls and women. Refugees always face strenuous journeys fleeing their home countries and many arrive in Nairobi unaccompanied and separated with very limited access to shelter, food, uh, medical care, and education. Most of them do not speak English or Swahili and uh, face high risks of abuse, exploitation, discrimination, sexual and gender-based violence, early pregnancies, early marriages, and post-traumatic distress order. So refishi is usually the first place these young women can feel secure, protected, and cared for after experiencing difficult and often traumatic journeys uh, to Nairobi. Although uh, under Kenya's laws, and this is the constitution 2010, it guarantees a number of uh, uh, rights and freedoms to refugees. And one of them is to enter, remain, and reside anywhere in the country. However, Kenya has an encampment policy, which simply uh, requires refugees to reside in designated camps of uh, Dadaab, Kakuma, and Kalobei settlements. In most times, they will need a movement pass in order to travel anywhere outside uh, those camps. However, there is an exception to this policy, and one category of persons uh, exempted from residing in the camps that I've mentioned are unaccompanied and separated minors a delicate group that gives existence um, to refugee. Kenya is a party to a number of uh, international treaties and conventions by virtue of Article 26 of the 2010 Constitution. And uh, some of these uh, treaties include the 1951 uh, UN Convention, the 1969 OAU Convention. Nationally, uh, Kenya has gone a notch higher to enact um, uh, governing laws that are answer the question of refugees in the country. And this include the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the Refugees Act 2006, as well as the Kenya Citizenship and Immigration Act uh, 2011. All these acts that I've mentioned um, guarantee a number of rights, uh, but just to mention a few, one is uh, access to documentation to refugees and asylum seekers in order to legalize their stay in the country as well as access to insertion services such as healthcare. Secondly is access to basic education to all children, children uh, living in the country. Um, refugee also involves itself in advocacy work and uh, part of it is just to provide protection which is a key foc with a key focus on the rights of children and women. So we facilitate the process of documentation with the Refugee Affairs Secretariat, which is an arm of government that uh, deals with management of refugees in the work. We work closely with other stakeholders to ensure that rights of children and women, especially unaccompanied and separated minor, uh, accompany 
and are, are protected. This is usually done through capacity building and advocacy to the police department, office of the student department, as well as uh, the local administration and at large the, the Kenyan community where refugees uh, do reside with other uh, Kenyans. Refishi is also a member of the Refugee Bill Task Force. Um, this is a task force that uh, was put in place um, by the Kenyan government to ensure that uh, we have a new refugee law enacted in the country. And one of the issues that uh, this law um, wants to resolve is to resolve the issue of encampment policy, which will see ref re refugees and asylum seekers integrate with other Kenyan uh, communities, not necessarily being in the camp, but uh, in other uh, urban centers uh, within Kenya. So ladies and gentlemen, refugee uh, recognizes the importance of educating our partners in government, uh, the NGO sector, policy groups, and civil society actors about the challenges experienced by the young uh, women that we serve at Refishi. So up to there, I thank you so much for your time and I hand you over to my colleague, Nancy Tamasha, to take you through the next session. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Joanne. So I think with that global perspective, then we'd be asking ourselves, so how do we respond? So at Refishi, our typical girl will be unaccompanied meaning she traveled to Kenya in the company of complete strangers. Perhaps she was in school and then she had the war broke out in her village. And so she didn't have time to find where everyone, everyone is at. So she just runs with anyone who's running. So they'll be unaccompanied or separated, meaning she traveled in the company of familiar people, but is, un, is unaware of their immediate family's whereabouts. Uh, often the girl will be a survivor of sexual and gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. She may have a child or be pregnant as a result of that experience and is basically trying to process multiple traumatic events. And uh, due to a strained access to documentation, jobs, public services, and of course, fewer resettlement opportunities for refugees, you will find that a girl unsuccessfully moves from one place to another trying to make ends meet. And it's not uncommon for us to receive girls that are severely malnourished, very sick, and some of whom have been abused. And uh, so at Refishi, we try to address a girl's needs from all angles. Is it shelter, education, livelihood support? And we start with the case management program, uh, which is the first point of contact for all girls that come to Refishi. We receive referrals from partner agencies, UNHCR, government, and the community itself. So uh, at, at the case management level, we do assessments to understand the girls' individual needs. Now, just because the girls have gone through, <clears throat> sorry, just because the girls have gone through similar events, usually their experiences often differ, and therefore our response must be tailored to each girl. Um, our first priority is usually to provide physical relief where we see to it that the girl and her child have access to basics such as food, shelter, medicals, hygiene products uh, such as sanitary towels, diapers for their babies, just small items that start restoring their dignity and confidence. And there's a category of girls that we receive that have undergone severe trauma and are unable to cope on their own. For example, you find a girl is pregnant as a result of sexual abuse, she's sick, she has nowhere to stay and has no family, no known support system. So we place them in our self shelter, which is um, our safe house, which is a transitional shelter that provides around the clock support uh, to provide physical and mental healing and recovery. Um, once, uh, when the girl is in the house, she will receive counseling, she'll receive peer support from other girls and will have access to mind body healing activities such as yoga and dance, usually that's Zumba and so many other things. And um, once we've addressed the basics, uh, we've made sure that the girl is physically healthy and, and she has access to you know, basic needs, then we seek to facilitate the girl's psychological and emotional healing through trauma-informed approaches. Now, obviously, this takes time and requires a wide range of therapeutic interventions, but we'll usually start by supporting the girl through individual counseling sessions, group therapy sessions, where she's able to hear stories and experiences similar to her own. Um, majority of the girls we receive 
at Refishi are placed in our girls empowerment program, which is the education and skill building program. And um, as Joanne explained earlier, refugee girls and young women are at risk of early marriage, child labor, sexual exploitation, among others. Now, without education and a means to a livelihood, these risks are multiplied. So through the Girls Empowerment Program, girls are able to start, uh, they're able to either start or catch up with school. They also learn important life skills, such as their rights as women and their rights as refugees in the country. They also have access to vocational skills, such as tailoring. And we also have some girls making doormats, bags, and clothes that they sell and um, earn a living. For example, uh, last week, we had some of our children, we have a daycare center. So some of our children in the daycare center graduated and all the gowns were actually made by one of our girls. These are skills that she learned and perfected on campus. So we were very proud of that. Uh, something else that's very exciting is that we are currently building an IT lab where we want to expose girls to the opportunities available digitally. So we currently have 21 girls enrolled in computer class uh, starting to learn the basics and we aspire that they will continue to a place where they can do things like coding. Uh, so our aim is to provide access to various avenues with the hope that each girl will find at least one thing that they can use to build their future. Uh, we also have an early childhood center uh, that I talked about earlier that, care, that cares for the girl's children. This ensures that the girl can focus on rebuilding her life without worrying about the safety of her child. You realize these are not girls that can afford nannies. They don't have a family that they can leave their child with. So we make sure that we have a place where the child can be safe as we help the mom to rebuild her life. Um, now, a major, major aim of Refishi is to foster independence through economic empowerment. We know that a girl, and especially a refugee girl, that does not have a means to earn income is at risk for so many social evils, top of which is usually sexual exploitation and abuse. So after the girls acquire skills through vocational training, they have an opportunity to earn a stipend through our social enterprise known as the Artisan Collective. Now in the Artisan Collective, they learn, um, uh, they learn to make scarves such as the one I'm wearing right now and other products. So the collective is a two year um, apprenticeship program that exposes the girls to the real world in relation to earning a living. So to join the collective, the girls have to apply and go through an interview process and once they get in, they earn a monthly, uh, monthly stipend and they also open a savings account where they deposit a set amount every month. We also have girls that have used these savings to start businesses and even have one who was able to send her child to school from these savings. So in addition, the Artisan uh, Collective exposes the girls to financial literacy and business trainings to expose them to their entrepreneurial abilities to help them uh, see themselves as entrepreneurs that they can do something when they learn to make, uh, when they learn to tie and dye, when they learn to make bags, then we, they're also taught uh, simple things like bookkeep, uh, bookkeeping, how to start a business, how to register your business, how to market yourself, because these are things that can help them to, you know, uh, move from uh, dependency and be independent and even maybe become employers for other refugee girls and young women. So I'm sure you have noticed that we have a very holistic approach to how we support a girl, where we not only cater to their physical needs, but we support a girl to heal psychologically. And then for sustainability, we empower the girl through education and access to our life, uh, to a livelihood. So our aim in all this is to empower each girl with the skills and resources required to advocate for their own rights and needs as refugees in Kenya, but also just as young women and girls that should have an opportunity and a shot at this life. Yeah, so back to you, Jaylan and Dina. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, before we open it up to questions, uh, everyone should see the Q&A box. Um, so if you want to put questions in there and then we can take them as panelists, feel free to uh, pose questions to all of us, individual questions, uh, whatever you have. 
And then if you are interested in learning more on how you can help support refugee, uh, there's a few different ways and we're happy to, to answer more. Um, one is investing, right? We're, we're a nonprofit and uh, accepting donations is a, is a large way of ensuring that we can continue our programming, continue investing in the future of the women and girls and supporting our team in Kenya who do this work. Uh, we've got a link below if you are interested in donating. Um, another way is our uh, helping us create a team and joining us for our virtual fashion challenge. Uh, as uh, Tamasha had mentioned, our artisan collective, the girls create beautiful fabric. And this year we are going to do a project runway style um, competition. We do this every year, except this year we are taking it to Nairobi uh, where we will have East African designers actually compete using the fabric that the girls make. Uh, it will be virtual, it will go live on October 21st, and we are hoping that everyone joins us and create teams to, to join us on that. We also have our global ambassador program. So this is for individuals that are really interested in learning more about our programs, going deeper, um, meeting our team, and then also supporting the organization by um, hosting fundraising events or talks or salons in your in your city, in your neighborhood, your community. Um, we're always looking for folks to join the Global Ambassador Programs. Um, hosting events and scarf socials are also a great way. The holiday season is great for scarf socials. You can get a lot of your holiday uh, shopping done. Um, and then we encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn uh, or Facebook or Instagram as well and learning more. So those are ways that you can help support the organization. Um, and then we'd love to open it up to Q&A. Uh, and Dean and Hannah, if you have any uh, words while we open it up to attendees. Yeah, I, I will just, so two things. Um, please reach out to me on any of the uh, items Jaylon just went through and on ways to help. If you want more information, happy to, happy to explain and, and, and get you plugged in. If anybody on the phone is part of Robert Heffer Pertivity, just a reminder, we have a matching program uh, with, with the organization and contact me for details on that. I could send you the link and gives you an opportunity to have our company match whatever, whatever we put in. So I just wanted to uh, um, uh, highlight those two things. And yep, thanks Nick for suggesting we put it in the chat. Great. I think we've got the chat moving along. Um, the Q and A. Also just wanna add that also liking us on LinkedIn and following us is also a great way to support us because we are trying to spread awareness and the word about the work we do and, you know, asking your network and friends on Facebook to also like us and follow us will be also an additional great support for us. So thank you for that as well. It seems like that we're gonna use the chat function. Um, so if you, if uh, folks want to put in their questions to panelists and all attendees, and I can ask the questions out loud and we can answer them for you. I'm going to start with a, with a question. Oh, go ahead. We've got one there. We have one. I'll ask mine after. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you see the organization evolving over the next few years? Dina, Joanne, Tamasha, do you want to take that question? I can, I can go first, and I'm sure that the rest of the team can jump in, and that is the exciting role I have as the new managing director for refugees and working with our team on in Kenya and with our board. We are going to start strategic planning process over the next uh, quarter of the year, and we will have that more formalized, but basically the organization wants to go to the next level. Of, we are still a young organization, but at the same time had really great impact. So one of the things that we are looking at is how we can replicate our model, be able to scale up, 
looking at data and impact to be able to show really how did we move the needle on certain issues uh, would be another thing that we are going to be focusing on. We are looking into how we can diversify our funding. The US government have been our largest donors and we have some big foundations who support us, but we are also looking at more of a grassroots support through sponsorship programs and other things. So really it's an exciting time for the organization and um, we will be definitely um, posting a lot of those news on our LinkedIn and Facebook. So please follow us. But basically, if I want to summarize, it's how we can replicate and scale up our program, focus on the impact and the data, and how we can diversify our funding and be able to have a grassroots support because, you know, donors have their own mandates and requirements, which is great. But also, we want to be able to support our core program and serve more women based on their needs. So that's why gra grassroots support and sponsorship is very important for us to grow as well. Nancy and uh, Jawan, do you want to jump in and add? You have been in the organization longer than me, so please feel free to jump in. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, for me, one thing that I, I look forward is uh, scalability, the same way you, you've talked about. And one thing that uh, COVID has taught us is that um, things can still move with technology. So we really want to leverage on technology in terms of, uh, you know, providing those computer skills to our girls so that they can uh, take up our digital work. So we are looking forward to have, to reach out to so many girls so that um, they can leverage on technology and do digital work because, uh, I mean, digital work and space is the way to go. So we really want to scale up to that end. Yes, thanks. Great. Hanny, did you want to ask your question? Oh, and we've got another question as well. <laughs> go, go ahead. I'll do mine last. Um, what is your biggest roadblock and how can we help? Joanne, do you want to do you want to take this one? You probably know the biggest roadblocks that refugees are facing. Yeah, um, like I said, as an organization, we will want to reach out to more beneficiaries, to more uh, refugees, especially in Nairobi, and even maybe just uh, a scale up, maybe to the camps as well as outside Nairobi. So, and this, of course, will require um, a lot of resources in terms of funding. So, if we got funding to reach more people, we'll be very happy and uh, appreciative of that. Yeah, just building on that, obviously money is important and uh, to serve our mission is exactly what we were saying earlier, like diversifying our funding, having grassroots uh, base of supporters and again, spreading the message about our work, even just by buying a scarf or liking us on LinkedIn is really helpful because again, we want to be able to have a grassroots base support and be able to carry the mission by having more supporters on board. Yeah, and I think in addition to that is just sharing ideas through our social media pages. If you come across um, any resources that you feel would be helpful, maybe programs, maybe just ideas that to, to help us scale up because we serve a very diverse um, group of girls. So anything that can help us improve or sa our services, anything that can help us improve how we think and how we see things, that would also be helpful to share with us. Danny? Yeah, I think, um, you know, how did the organization start? Obviously, I, I know the answer to the question, but it'd be good for, for others to hear. How, when did the organization start? How did it start? Sure, I can take that one. Um, so the organization started in 2008. Our co-founders, Ann Sweeney and Talon Good, uh, were working in East Africa at the time on refugee affairs. Uh, and they saw that there was a major gap in services, especially when it came to unaccompanied minors and even more specifically women and girls. Um, so they really uh, kind of designed Refugee to be able to support that gap. Um, they were seeing that girls were kind of falling through the cracks of the services that were provided in the camps and also the urban settings, um, but especially the urban settings. And so Refugee's holistic model kind of came to, to be from that. And then I have one more question. Jalen, can you talk about the mental health campaign 
you know, that's, that's a very hot topic. And, and we're realizing the importance of focusing on mental health as much as we have been focusing on physical health. I know that's been an important topic, even at our organization, Productivity, and we've, we've had some, some very important communications and campaigns on it. And I think, I think a lot of folks will relate to what we're doing here as well. Yeah, absolutely. So mental health has always been part of our holistic model, um, but we realized that there was a lot more depth that we can go. There's a ton of research that has come out on mental health, psychology, neuroscience. We know a lot more about our brain. We know a lot more about how trauma is stored in the brain, um, how trauma is stored in the body. Uh, and so we wanted to look at how do we provide additional resources for our counselors increase the number of counselors that we have and also increase programming. So we're working on deepening our mental health services. Um, that includes, we brought two uh, specialists to put together a workshop of the science behind trauma um, that helped our staff, but also our girls actually understand the science behind trauma. So, you know, one of the things the counselors told us um, when we started this uh, kind of these discussions was there is no one word for trauma in Kiswahili. So how do we even begin to talk about trauma um, if there's no way to define it? And then also in the social sector, we have this tendency to tell our participants and beneficiaries, well, you've been through trauma. Okay, well, what does that mean? Um, so what we wanted for the workshop was to actually empower the girls to understand what is that science, right? What is happening when they have undergone complex trauma, acute trauma? How does it store differently in the body? Um, how, do, uh, how is it able now through neuroscience and different types of practices to actually rewire the brain, right? Neuroplasticity allows for rewiring of the brain, retraining the brain. Um, so that was kind of the ground is, is to first provide them with that understanding. And then hopefully it allows them to seek wanting to get mental health and it also pushes against taboos. We know there's a lot of taboo when it comes to mental health, especially in, in a lot of the cultures um, that the girls are coming from. And then the next thing that we're looking at is um, hopefully being able to upskill our counselors in some of the more neuroscience-based practices. So things like EMDR, uh, which is a neuroscience-based approach, which again, allows you to not just deal with how triggers are coming in, um, but teach the brain to wire around how that trauma is stored within nodes uh, within the brain. Um, and by upskilling our counselors, they're able to do more effective work because every girl is different. So for some girl, talk therapy might work. For another one, talking actually re-triggers things. So taking a more neuroscience-based approach works. We're also doing yoga, meditation, body movement. So for some, just moving the body and being able to move trauma through the body is the best way to do it. Um, so that's kind of our hope is in the next year or two, and, and this is really for the team to take forward, but it's a, it's a passion of mine. Um, and kind of my hope was to, to bring this to the table was how do we deepen that pathway and really have that be something that we're leading the charge on. Thanks, Jaylon. I, um, I think what you've described is cutting edge and even beyond what, what even some, some folks are doing in the United States. So i um, very imp impressed with it and, it, you, know, you know, so much has been done in a very short period of time within Refugee on the mental health space, so thank you. Thanks. I don't think we have any more questions, but feel free. I am available if any questions come up and um, if there, more information is needed. Um, but really, what, again, want to thank everybody for joining. We wanted to make sure we, we gave adequate time for questions, so we kept the, the, the presentation at least for the first 30 minutes. So thanks, everybody, for being on time and, um, you know, look, looking forward to, to the future and gr growing refugee and having your support. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, honey. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.